Amen to that. That is a wonderful story to hear that we're reaching children in our neighborhood and we continue. You know, for some reason this week when I was working on our scripture, every sort of distraction came my direction that I possibly could imagine. And I will tell you that I even stand here today, I usually don't get nervous, but for some reason this morning, I am somewhat nervous to even go over this section of scripture. Uh, So if you would, just join me in a moment of prayer as we prepare our hearts to hear today's message. Heavenly Father, we do come before you and we thank you, Lord God, that this is your word and not ours. Father, we pray that you would give us the strength to hear what you want us to hear, Lord. I pray that you would give me the strength to speak clearly and to allow the Holy Spirit to do the work, Father. We thank you again for all the work that you have done in our lives and continue to do. And we pray, Father God, that as we move forward as a church, that we continue to ask the tough questions. And that we ask, what is it that you want us to do to serve this community well and to serve each other well? And it's in the master's name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. You know, as I said, this is one of those letters that I think any church would not want to get. It's one of those letters that when you read it, you sort of sit there and go, that hurt. Uh, There are others that have sort of this, hey, there's some bad, but there's also some good. And in this one, it is just an absolute warning to the church. And as we look at it, you know, I was thinking about our culture today. And we really are in this sense of me kind of culture, aren't we? We look at Twitter, we look at Facebook, we look at all the different social medias that are out there, and it's all about what I have, and it's all about me, and it's all about the things that I do, and look at the trips that I take, and look at all the things that are going on in my life that are good, and we sort of brag, and even when we turn on TV, we have it even going into all of our youngsters, right? I mean, you look at every TV show that's out there. They have TV show after TV show that's all about me and look at me. And even when I'm complaining about my issues, you should look at me and listen to my struggles. And it's a real thing that we need to deal with because what we are facing today is a culture that is becoming more and more self-centered. It's not other-centered. And I would say even in the church, this is where we have to focus. We have to really ask, are we Christ-centered or are we becoming self-centered? Are we going to church for what it can do for me and not what it can do for others? Or are we going to church for what it can help me with rather than saying, how does it glorify God for me to be here? It's the old saying that I've heard other pastors say that some of them wake up in the morning and this is their first comment. Lord, let you be glorified even if it's at my own expense. But it's almost like we've changed that. We've come and we say, Lord, you know what? I want you to take care of me and I have all of these things that need to be met. And if they're met, then I will serve you. And yet Christ is calling us to serve him no matter what. And do we glorify him even in the midst of storms and trials and hardship, just as we would glorify him when things are going well. And it is a real struggle. It's a struggle that even I face. I will tell you that most pastors struggle with this because we're sort of the leaders of the church, right? People look to us. We're we're sort of at that point where every Sunday morning has to be our A game. I mean, that's what the elders pay us for is, yes, to shepherd throughout the week. But if we came up every Sunday morning and the messages were just terrible, you'd all be leaving the church. You'd say, you know what, we're going to go find somebody else. So there becomes sort of this ego at times, this self-centeredness, this narcissistic kind of behavior that can creep in. And I will tell you that I am grateful for having some of the mentors that I have because when I share things with them, they are very quick to point out things to me. And I will never forget that after I had graduated seminary, uh, one of my professors came to me and and he said, Stephen, I just want you to remember one thing, that whenever you're speaking in front of a church, there are people that do not have your education, but they are smarter than you. They actually know scripture better than you know it. And if you don't listen to this, God will humble you. And he was sharing from his own personal experience that here's a man who had been studying God's word for 30 plus years. And I've listened to him preach and he is phenomenal. 
And he said, Stephen, after 15 years, I stood before the church thinking I knew all the answers. And I went down and I talked to somebody and I thought, well, I, I know that person. They're not educated. But God used him to humble me. So that's something that we all have to wrestle with. Because we do kind of have that drive. We do have that pride that wants to creep in, right? Where it's that matter of like, hey, look at me. Look at what I can do. Or, or when people come and they say, hey, you did great. And you're like, oh, that's awesome. And you can see it. It starts building and building and building. And yet it becomes more about you than what God is doing through you. And that is something that we all have to realize as believers. So if you look at your insert, we are on the last letter. I've put in all the different points that we've gone over, all the different lessons. And this one I have to give credit to Trinity because as I was sitting at a coffee shop and really kind of wrestling with how I was going to structure this message and I was kind of speaking out loud, which I like to do, and I'm sure everybody at Starbucks is going, what is he talking about again? Um, my daughter was just kind of like tapped at me and I, I said, okay, and I took my headphones out and she said, dad, I think what you're trying to say is this. And she said it. She said, Christians are to be Christ-centered, not self-centered. So I will tell you that I am giving her all the credit for this main point and then everything I built off of that. But in reality, that is the truth. That is what we're supposed to be as Christians. We are supposed to be Christ-centered, not self-centered. Because when we become self-centered, we will see in this letter what happens and how we can be Taken away from what God wants us to do. And even to the point where I will tell you this. That last night I ate something that did not set well. And I thought for a minute. Oh no. It's happening again. Because every time I speak on this letter. I get sick to my stomach for some reason. And I thought either I jinxed myself last night. Or I just jinxed myself all week thinking great. I'm going to have to have this analogy in a trash can up here. But thank the Lord. He prevailed. And I didn't get sick. And I can do this without a practical application for you. And a visual one. But this church, when you hear this letter, I really think that as Christians, when we read it, we need to understand the severity of God's voice here. Christ is not mixing words with this church. And I will tell you that when you look at where this church was at, this city was so wealthy that even when they were destroyed by a massive earthquake in 60 A.D., they looked at Rome and said, we need absolutely nothing from you, and we will take care of ourselves. And they rebuilt the city from scratch. That's how wealthy this city was. So you can imagine how that also then infiltrated within the church. Because sometimes we look at material wealth and we think we're doing fine, but we'll see later on that we really aren't fine at all. Because what Jesus is looking at is not our bank account. Not how big our house is, not whether we can rebuild things, but he's looking at our spiritual account. And he's looking at it spiritually and saying, how are you doing today? How are you doing tomorrow? How are you going to be in the future? And that's what needs to be growing. So let's dive into our text. I'm going to read it right here. Verse 14, chapter 3 of Revelation. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write. The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. It is clear that Jesus is the Son of God. And the people that are hearing this are hearing, this is not coming from an idol. This is not coming from Zeus or some other God. This is coming from the living God, and he is coming with a message that you need to hear. It is the one who is faithful, and it is the one who is the true witness. And it was the one who was a part of creation. So there is no doubt that they can sit there and say, well, you know, we can kind of ignore this message because it just came from somebody. No, they're hearing. This is coming from Jesus Christ. And you better take heed of what's going on. Because I will tell you that when you look at text, whenever you see that amen, that is really where Jesus is saying, now it's time to listen. So when John is writing this and saying the, the amen, it is you better heed the words that are coming that your direction. And it's something that even as I wrestled with this week, I continue to ask myself, you know what, God, am I really Christ-centered or am I on this side and I'm starting to become self-centered? How am I living my life? 
How am I living my life with my children, with my wife, with my friends, with my coworkers, with everybody that I interact with? Is it more about me or is it about Jesus Christ? And there's where it needs to be. Because when we are Christ-centered, then we can do amazing things for God's kingdom. God will work in and through us when we are focused on him. So let's dive into our text, verse 14. Excuse me, sorry, 15. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, if we look at those few passages, here's what it's saying. Self-centeredness leads one to being an ineffective witness for Christ. And this does not mean that Christ wants us to be hot for him, that we're zealous and that we're eager and we're go-getters, and then the cold means that we're over here on the sideline not doing anything for him. That's not at all what this is meaning. Because when you look at this city, they had a body of a river that was cold, and then they had the hot springs that were valuable as well. And I will tell you, you all know this, that when it's a hot summer day here in Chicago in this area, boy, an ice-cold glass of water is sure refreshing, isn't it? And then it's sure refreshing when you have boiling hot water that you can sit in on those cold winter nights, right, when it's 25 below in the middle of January. There is benefit and value of both of those. And back then there was benefit and value of those things too. Because you could use the cold water to be refreshed and you could use the hot springs for medicinal purposes, for healing, for health. So Jesus is saying, you're neither of these. You really are lukewarm. Now, I don't know if any of you or how many of you have ever been to a uh, Chinese restaurant. I absolutely love tea. I love it when it comes out piping hot and it is the most delicious thing in the world. But then there are those times where you pour it in the cup and you get ready to drink it and it is lukewarm. It's almost lost all of its flavor and taste and it's like, oh. That is worthless. Why did I even take a sip of that? And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, because you are neither, because you have become so lukewarm, you are no longer effective for my kingdom. You're no longer effective for the ministry that I've called you to do. That I'm about to literally spit you out of my mouth. To take it a little bit further, it's almost as Jesus is saying, you know what, I'm going to just reject you. That's pretty harsh. Because if you really think about what this means to be, to have something when you are sick, right? And we've all been sick before. And we eat something and our stomach is just like, there's no way this is getting past me. There's no way it's getting any further than this. And it's coming out. Think about what it says right here in this text. That Jesus is looking at this church and saying, look... You are no longer an effective witness. And I'm at the point where I'm about to just spit you out. I'm at a point where I'm about to reject you. You better heed the warnings that I'm giving you. I think it's something that we as Christians all need to pray about. And to reflect. We need to ask. Jesus, are we effective for you? Are we doing the things that you once called us to do? Or are we at the point where you're looking at us and saying, you know what? You're not effective anymore. That is a very hard thing to deal with. And I will tell you that there are many great men who are sitting on the shelves collecting dust. Because they have become ineffective for God's ministry. And that is a sad thing to see. And it's something that even I wrestle with. Because there is a day that goes, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't wake up and say, okay, God, how can I be effective for your kingdom today? How is it that you want me to serve? How is it that you want me to love my family well? How is it that you want me to love my children well? How am I to love my spouse well that I'm still effective for your kingdom? It is a hard thing to look at. It's something that we all have to reflect on. When we look at the mirror, we should all be asking that very question. Am I effective still, God, for your kingdom? Or have I become ineffective? 
And if we become ineffective, then I think we need to go back to this and hear what Jesus is saying. There's a point where I'm about to reject you. I'm about to just spit you out of my mouth. This, again, is not the easiest letter. This is not the easiest text. This is not pretty. I mean, this is Jesus telling the church, you've become pointless. What you once did is no more. And because of that, I'm ready to say, I'm done. And that is hard. But I will tell you that if you study the church in Laodicea, they obviously heeded these words. Because in 365, if I remember my dates correct, there's the council in Laodicea where they accepted 26 of the New Testament books. So you can see that they became effective again. And that's something that we all have to wrestle with. Are we an ineffective witness? And here's the next part, verse 17. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy me from me gold refined by fire. So that you may be rich in white garments. So that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And the salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Self-centeredness leads one to not realize that they are spiritually bankrupt. If you remember the second letter, that church was poor beyond measure. But what was the word that Jesus gave to them? But you are rich spiritually. Because you have not forsaken my name. You have never turned away from me. And I will tell you that this is the exact opposite of what he's telling in this church. Because see, in this church where they are, they think because of all of the wealth that they have. All of the ways that they can take care of themselves. They must have thought, well, guess what? Because we're wealthy here, we must be prospering spiritually as well. They tied the two together. <laughs> And I will tell you, all you have to do sometimes is walk around in downtown Chicago and go talk to some of the homeless people, the ones that have nothing. And they start sharing about their faith with Jesus. And I've sat with some of those, and those people are wealthy beyond their means. They may have absolutely nothing. They may have no home. They may have nowhere to go except a shirt on their back. But when you see them talk about Jesus and you see them talk about how the Lord has continued to work in their lives and to provide for them, you can see the glow. You can see that they are spiritually wealthy. And I will tell you, church, that this is something that I'm sure we have all at one point or will at one point struggle with. It is something that we have to ask ourselves. Am I spiritually wealthy or am I spiritually bankrupt? And if we are spiritually bankrupt, then that's why we can no longer be in an effective witness for Christ. It's why we become almost worthless. Because how can Christ move in somebody who no longer sees their need for him? And they attach everything to what they have. And for the church to realize this, for this church, for them to finally get to the point where they're focused on Christ, what this message is saying to them, Are you willing to surrender everything you have and give up all the things that you have as idols and turn to me? We've seen that story time and time again, haven't we, in the New Testament? The rich man says, how do I get to heaven? What is Jesus' response? Sell it all and follow me. Well, I can't sell all that. He didn't realize what he was going to gain. And this is the warning to this church. You need to be willing to give up all the things that you're holding on to and say, you know what? No, I'm going to hold on to you, Jesus, because you are the one that makes me wealthy. You are the one that gives me the riches of life. It does not matter what we have here. None of it goes with us when we die. None of it. What goes with us is what we do that's made out of the precious metals. It's when we stand before Jesus and he says, you know what? Look at all the things that you've done. And I am so proud of you because you've been a servant of mine. 
It's that same saying that I've said before. We want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And to do that means that we use everything that we have for the glory of God. Even our finances. The homes that we have. Everything that we have has been given to us by God for a purpose. And it is not for us to brag about what we have. It's not for us to become envious of what others have. It's to say, you know what, God, this is what you've given me. How then am I to use it to glorify your kingdom? No matter what that may be. You don't have to have everything to help people. Because I will tell you something. We all have the one thing that we need. If you sit here today trusting in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you have a message that you can hand to somebody. You don't need to give them cash. You don't need to give them a car. You don't need to give them the shirt off your back. You can go right up to them and say, hey, I have the greatest thing to give you. It's not money. It's nothing but the Word of God. And I will tell you that that Word of God has seen me through thick and thin. That Word of God has seen me through every storm that I have faced. That Word of God has seen me through the great days. That Word of God has seen me through the bad days. The Word of God has continued to keep me anchored and grounded and trusting in Him. And I know that I will withstand whatever comes my way because Jesus is standing before me breaking the waves. That should cause us to have an amen. And that's how we need to live. But this is, I'm telling you, in society today, this is the exact opposite of what we're hearing. We're hearing that whole message of, it's all about you. It's not about anybody else. It's all about you. And I will tell you that that's sometimes one of the struggles, even in other religions. It's not about them. It's about what I can do. How can I do this? If you look at even our, our uh, churches out there that do the name it and claim it, it's about what can I get? not about what God gets. It's about what can I have? What can I do? Look at me. I've been in those churches. I'll never forget. I stepped into one and I, I was so dumbfounded by it because they had a sign where it said pastor's parking space. And the majority that came, it was in a lower income area. And the majority of the people who came barely had cars at work. And then yet here he is sitting there talking about his brand new car. And it's not just a cheap car. It's an expensive car. And then he has the audacity to go into the church and say, you know what, I am so blessed about how God has just richly blessed me with all the wealth and the things that I have. And I'm going, yikes. That's kind of scary. Because it was all about him. If you guys realize what it's about, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. Our entire life is not about us. It is all about Jesus. Jesus created us so that we can glorify the Father. We are to glorify God in everything that we do. And I will challenge the men that sit here. Trust me, the fingers point back at me. If there's times in your life, even right now, where you know you have not glorified God by the way you've interacted or t- spoken to your wife, then it's time to look at it and say, you know what, I'm sorry. Because what can happen is all of a sudden it becomes so much about us. And we start pointing the blame game. It's that person. It's that person. It's that person. And we do it no matter what. I do it even with friends. I have a friend right now that does the same thing. He blames everybody else. He sits there in Colorado and he calls me on the phone. And he just complains and he complains. He's like, Stephen, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I'm like, well, just look to the Bible. You've studied it. You know what you're supposed to be doing. And that's just repent. But he's become so self-conceited and self-centered that he's not seeing what God is doing. He's not seeing that God has blessed him with abundant gifts. I will tell you that he would have been one of the best worship pastors I've ever seen. But because he's over here on that self side, God is not blessing him. And there's times where we just have to go over here and we have to trust God. And it has to be all about him. We can't even serve others unless it's about him. Because when we serve others without him, we're doing that on our own will, our own desires. I bet you if I asked for a show of hands, you, some of you would probably raise your hands. Because I know, I, I've been there. There's times where I take this and I say, you know what, I'm going to go help this person. And I really am doing it for a different reason. It's not because God's called me to do it. I'm like, you know what? 
If I go help this person, then maybe they'll take me out to lunch. You know, I love food. Maybe they'll, or you know what? Maybe if I help this person, I'll get that favorite dessert that I like. I'm doing it for the wrong motives. Again, it's all about me. And I will tell you that when it's all about us, we then start to miss where God is leading us to help others. It's where we're walking down the streets or when we're in the park and we see somebody who is sitting on a park bench crying and we say, oh, I don't have the time to deal with that. I've got my own things to worry about. And maybe that's the moment where Christ has said, you know what, this is where I wanted you to go. I wanted you to go reach out to this person. This is something that's hard for all of us to do with. Because I am in the same boat you are. There are many times where I'm like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to go out and serve you, God. You haven't taken care of my needs. You haven't met me yet. I haven't heard from you for a while. I think that sometimes some of the hardest parts about being in youth group and in youth, a youth, is they're asking, well, why isn't God, God isn't answering me? You know what? Sometimes he doesn't. He doesn't answer us right then and there. But he's giving us opportunities to serve. And when we go serve, then that's where we start seeing God answer our prayer. You know, for the longest time I had, had prayed when I became a believer. I said, God, where is it that you want me to be? How am I supposed to interact in ministry? And this is how self-centered I became. I had an opportunity to serve at Pacific Garden Mission. And I was serving there every Wednesday night and every other Wednesday, the second and third Wednesday. I was preaching to five to four hundred people. And it got to a point where I was like, you know what, God? I'm glad that you gave me this. But nobody sees me doing this. The church that I go to doesn't see it. I'm not getting anything out of it. Yeah, I get to go when I preach, but whoop de doo I literally became self-centered. To the point where I even said to somebody, I said, you know what? I think it's time for me to just go ahead and be done. And I told them, I said, you know, you need to find somebody else to come and speak. So they did. A month later, I had this burning in my heart. And I was like, Lord, why did you do that? God allowed me to just walk out of something that he had blessed me with. To show me, Stephen, this is what happens when you become self-centered. You were so concerned about what others were seeing that you missed what was going on inside there. And I missed, and I'll tell you, how this is how he showed me. That when I was walking around downtown in Trinity, we'll tell you this, we'd walk around and there'd be homeless people going, you know, we really miss having you there. And I'd go home and I'm like, wow, God, I missed what you had done. Because it was so much about me and what I wasn't getting in return. We are not to be self-centered. And I will show you in verse 19 through 22 this point. That Christ-centeredness allows us to hear Jesus knocking on our hearts. And for some of us, he's knocking on our hearts saying, just let me in because you haven't trusted me. For others, maybe he's knocking on your heart and a part saying, you know what? You haven't given me this portion yet. He's not going to just be some mean ogre and just trance right in and say, I'm here. He's knocking at our hearts going, are you going to answer the door? And I will tell you as a church, it's something that we all have to ask. Is Jesus knocking at our door? And are we answering it? Let's look at verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, Jesus loves us so much. That yes, he will discipline us. And sometimes that disciplining isn't fun. Those of you who have teenagers or children, you understand that point. It's not easy sometimes when we have to discipline them. And we see the tears start going. I will tell you jokingly, 
uh, that my kids knew that all they had to do when they were babies was start quivering their bottom lip when I was disciplining them. And I would have to turn because I'd be like, Yvonne, you've got to take over because I can't do this. I mean, I really just couldn't do it. And I really think that Jesus is in some ways that way too. That he says, I don't want to do this. But when you step out of this boundary, I have to. But it's in a way to point us back to him. It's not to drive us further from him. It's to point us back to the work that he has done. Are you willing to be zealous? And are you willing to repent? The only way we can be zealous for Christ is to actually look at our hearts and say, you know what, God, I've got to repent of some things. I've got to let some things go. There are some areas in my life that I have just not dealt with and I don't want you to deal with. And honestly, it is throughout Scripture where we literally see time and time again where it says, you know what, you want to know why God hasn't blessed you? It's because you're not right with somebody. You're not right with this person. You're not right with that person. You haven't come back and just repented. And that's all he's waiting for. For some of us, all he's waiting for is you just say, you know what, I'm ready to go. And I'm going to take charge. And you know what, God, you just continue to lead me. That's my hope for us as a church. That we are zealous for him. And that we are quick to repent when there are things that are wrong in our own lives. We have to be willing to do it. This church at this point wasn't. That's why he had to say it. And then it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. What a great reward when we just answer that door. That here we have the God of the universe knocking at our door and saying, you know what, if you open it, I'm going to come in and dine with you. I want to have a meal with you. And you're going to eat with me. Isn't that amazing? We don't have a God that's angry. We don't have a God that's going to punish us and curse us. And say, you know what, I'm going to, you answer that door. And when, you walk, when I walk through it, I'm just going to point out all your little flaws and say you're terrible. No, no, no. I want to eat with you. That is a great reward. When we are Christ-centered. And I will tell you, church, that there are even parts of my own life right now that I still, at times, I'm like, you know what, God, I'm giving it to you a little bit, but I don't want to, I don't want to give it to you fully. It's something that we all wrestle with. I struggle with it. And here's one of the ways that I struggle with it. And I'll, I'll be as honest as I can be and transparent for you. I grew up in a family where everybody were entrepreneurs. I mean, I have a grandfather that literally came home from World War II went to Chicago, looked at Carrier and said, hey, by the way, there's no air conditioning business in St. Louis, so let me go ahead and start one. And if you ask my wife, when she went to see the company, she realized it wasn't just one block, it was seven blocks. And then all my uncles are all the same way. My father's the same way. And there's times where I struggle because I'm like, you know what, God, I'm not doing enough, so I have to do more. And God, I think, works in great ways. And he still works everything out for his good. He's got a purpose. But I will tell you this. The reason why we moved to Dallas was because of my own self-centeredness. Because I finally had convinced myself, you know what, God? My wife is smart with the IT stuff. She knows all those things. Look at the things that she can do. And then here I am. I'm not even doing any more work for you. I'm not even in a homeless shelter like I used to be. So for my kids to love me, for my family to love me, this is what I'm going to do. And I literally went through the whole process. I wrote a paper. I took a test. I went down and candidated with a school. Knowing full well that I was in disagreement with their whole philosophy when it came to counseling. Because I was so convinced that, you know what, I'm going to finally show everybody that I'm smart enough to do it. And I did it. And then I went back to my wife and I convinced her, hey, it's time for us to move. So I took my family and I said, you know what, this is great here, but now it's time for us to move. Those two years were not fun. It did lead to some pain and to some struggles. And it got to the point where this is how God works. Because
because there came a point where I said, you know what, God, I, I really goofed. I realized now that this was about me and not about you. And I'm sitting in a coffee shop. And I'm like, how am I going to tell my wife that I made a mistake? And God said, Stephen, I've always wanted you to go to Dallas Theological Seminary. And he opened the door. And even out of that, he opened the door because I got to have moments with mentors that I hadn't had for a while. And it was all because I realized how self-centered I had become. And it was going to lead to a path of destruction in my marriage. Because even when we were down there, it was still all about me. I missed some of the things that my daughter went through. Some of the things that my son went through. Because it was about me. My hope is that as I stand here before all of you, that you are willing to just say, you know what, God, if there's any part in my life that it's about me, I want to hand it back to you. I want to just give it to you. Because I don't want to be ineffective for your kingdom. I don't want to hear you say to me, I'm about to reject you. So as we close in a time of prayer, as we have our song, I ask that you would just reflect in your own life and where you are right now. And say, God, what is it that I have to give up? I must decrease so you can increase. It's a great analogy, too, when you're talking about weight loss. I must decrease so he can increase. But think about that. Where is it that you need to decrease so that Christ can increase in your life. We've all been there. The question is, are we willing to hear Jesus knocking at our heart? Don't walk out of here today if he is and say, I'll wait till tomorrow because tomorrow's not granted. Right now is. So would you join me in a time of prayer?